to our service this morning. Um, this morning I have good news and I have bad news. First, the good news. Uh, we are here this morning to worship and praise our God, the creator of all heaven and earth, whom through his mercy and grace sent his son so that our sins may be forgiven, so that we could inherit eternal life, that precious gift. Now, that's the best news. <coughs> the bad news, well, the lights are on, so there is no bad news. Uh, so, <laughs> so, so thankfully we, we will have no interruptions to our, to our service today. Angelique will lead us in prayer and, and Nadine will do the, the reading. And then we look, look forward to the next installment in Jomo's series on James. Uh, if you were here last week, You'll be, you'll be looking forward to this week's installment. And so if we could all stand as we say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Shreva. Heavenly Father, we come before you in awe and gratitude, acknowledging your endless goodness that permeates every aspect of our lives. You are the source of all that is good, the giver of every perfect gift. Your love and mercy surround us, bringing comfort in times of need and joy in moments of celebration. Today we lift our voices in praise for your unwavering faithfulness. <coughs> you have never failed us and your goodness endures forever. Your grace is a wellspring of hope, renewing our spirits and guiding us along the path of righteousness. In moments of doubt, your goodness shines through, reminding us of your promises and assuring us of your presence. You have given us the ultimate demonstration of your goodness through your Son, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself to redeem us from sin and grant us eternal life. May we never cease to marvel at your goodness, O Lord. <coughs> Fill our hearts with gratitude that we, may that we may reflect your love and kindness to the world around us. Lord, we humbly come before you acknowledging our shortcomings and the weight of our sin. We confess that we have fallen short of your perfect standards, standards and we seek your forgiveness. Forgive us, Father, for the times we have neglected to love our neighbours as ourselves, for the moments we have failed to extend grace and mercy, for the times we have strayed from your righteous path. Cleanse our hearts and purify our minds and restore to us a right relationship with you. Grant us the courage to face our weaknesses honestly and the strength to turn away from our evil desires. Help us to learn from our mistakes and to grow in wisdom and maturity. May your forgiveness wash over us, renewing our spirits and guiding us to walk in righteousness. May our lives be a reflection of your goodness as we seek to honor you in all that we do. Father, we come before you with hearts flowing, overflowing with gratitude and humbled by your abundant blessings. We thank you for the gift of life and the breath in our lungs, for the beauty of creation that surrounds us and the love and fellowship we share. Thank you, Father, for the provision of our daily needs, for the roof over our heads and the food in our tables. Thank you for the relationships that enrich our lives and the moments of joy and laughter that bring light to our days. Lord, we pray for those burdened by financial, relationship and health difficulties, and we ask for your divine help and guidance. In our moments of struggle, we look to you as our ultimate provider, healer, and reconciler. Grant us wisdom and discernment in managing our finances, that we may be good stewards of the resources that you have entrusted to us. Mend our broken relationships and bring healing, forgiveness, and reconciliation. 
Touch our bodies and minds with your healing hand and restore to us wholeness and strength. Help us, Lord, to trust in your faithfulness, knowing that you are our ever-present help in all times of trouble. May our struggles draw us closer to you and deepen our faith. Almighty God, we ask humbly that you intervene in a world plagued by evil, corruption and war. We lift our voices in prayer, seeking your divine guidance and intervention. Lord, we ask for your light to penetrate the darkness that shrouds our world. Bring healing where there is brokenness and peace where there is conflict and justice where there is corruption. Overcome the forces of evil with your mighty hand. Grant wisdom and discernment to leaders and individuals that they may strive for righteousness and pursue paths of peace. In the face of adversity, let us find comfort in your promise that you are with us and that goodness will ultimately prevail. Gracious Lord, we thank you for your precious gift of your word. Illuminate our minds and our hearts, Holy Spirit, as we study and meditate upon its truths. Grant us wisdom and a hunger to apply your teaching to our lives. In Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Good morning, church. The reading today is James 1, chapter 1, verses 1 to 18. James, a servant of God and of the Lord Jesus Christ, to the twelve tribes in the dispersion. Greetings. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete lacking in nothing. If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him, but let him ask in faith, with no doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave on the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. For that person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is double-minded. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Let the lowly brother boast in his escalation and the rich in his humiliation, because like a flower of the grass, he will pass away. For the sun rises with its scorching heat and withers the grass. Its flower falls, and its beauty perishes. So also will the rich man fade away in the midst of his pursuits. Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. Let no one say, when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. But each person is tempted when he is lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it is, has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation of shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that he should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. This is the word of God. Good morning, my brothers, again in Christ. What a great privilege it is. We gather around God's word to be challenged, to be inspired, and sometimes to be rebuked gently. 
And um, the Lord is good and he just keeps reminding us of the main things. He says, just keep the main thing, the main thing. We are someone number three from the book of James. And we've entitled this series, Living Our Faith. In other words, as Christians, on a daily basis, living as Christians. We looked at trials last week. Now we're looking at temptations this, this morning. Temptation to sin. Now, let me just give you at least the basic um, definition of temptation. Temptation is being invited or enticed or allured to sin. It's when something is presented to you that you know full well God said no and you have to make a decision that's temptation and temptation is everywhere it really is literally everywhere your phone it's got plenty of temptation. You know, you, you, you could be talking to a friend about something, and next minute when you go on your Facebook, suddenly you have adverts about it because Google was listening to your conversation. But your cell phone can really be a dreadful source of temptation, especially in issues of pornography. It's right there in, in your hands. TVs, source of great temptations. Magazines, on the street, you're driving in your old little car and the guy just parks his five-liter en engine next to you and he revs and you suddenly feel, oh, only if I could have that, not this. Uh, you go home and you sit down and you start working on your computer, a budget. You want to buy a car you don't need with the money you don't have to impress people who don't care. What's the point? What is the point? That's temptation for you. Yeah? And, and, and in the shops, temptation is everywhere. The guys who own shops, they tell you that honest hard-working, successful business people in the upper highway, if there's load shedding and the generator doesn't start, they steal. Suddenly, oh, I don't have to buy this tuna. Because oh, it's dark. Something you wouldn't even think about if it wasn't load shedding. And when you do, and things go wrong, you get caught. You notice how quick we are to blame others for it. Do you remember when God confronted Adam for his sin? Adam turned around and said to God, it's not me. It's the woman you gave me. Good man like me, I accepted her, and, and look what she's done. Look what she's done. She's given me the fruit, and out of politeness, I ate it. But it's not me. It's Eve. And God confronts Eve. What have you done? And what does Eve do? Oh, it's not me, me. No, whoa, whoa. it's the serpent. I was minding my own business. In fact, I was praying. And the serpent showed up and gave me this thing. And, and I had to eat it. So it's not my fault. The one I love most in the Bible is Aaron's one. Moses goes up to the mountain and he's with the Lord. And the people gather and they're like, hey, this guy has gone for so long. I mean, who knows? Maybe he's dead. Why don't we create our own God, the God we can worship? And Aaron says to them, just go and get all your gold. I mean, the Bible goes as far as to say, take the gold from the ears of your wives huh? and bring it. And they bring the gold and Aaron, he 
melts the whole thing up and he builds this golden calf. And Moses shows up. He's glowing with God's glory. He says, what have you done, my brother? I love it. It's not me, my brother. I threw, these people, they gave me gold. And I threw people's gold into the fire and poof, out came this golden cup. I didn't make it. I, didn't, I just threw gold into the fire. And what happened? The next thing happened. There it was standing there. And the people are worshipping it. And I feel so bad about it. But it's not me. I didn't make it. Didn't make it. It just popped out of the fire. I love it. Well, how about this? It's not me. Satan made me do it. Not me. No, 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 no. I didn't do it. Satan made me do it. Well, it's not me. It's not me. I am a violent man, but it's not me. It's my upbringing. My dad was a violent man. My mom abused me. That's why I am violent. Now, kick your teeth, but it's not my fault. It's my upbringing. Just, just my upbringing. How's that? It's not me. It's my medication. <laughs> and sometimes we're brave enough like Adam. It's not me, it's God. I took that tuna because I needed it. And if God is sovereign, why did he let them catch me? Because he should have protected me. So it's God's fault that I was caught with that thing in my hands. So in other words, when we face temptations, it tends to be that we don't want to take responsibility for our actions. And James is writing to the church to really help them think long and hard about that because he wants them to take responsibility for their actions. James, essentially, he's saying every time you fall, you will not learn anything. Because the moment you get up, you are already ready to blame someone or something. And you would never, ever overcome temptation. Because every time you face it, you just simply yield in. And you blame someone else for it. And James says, no, it shouldn't be like that for us as Christians. If we fail, if Satan or sin in us tempts us, we should take responsibility for it. But above all, we should never ever place the blame at God's door. Never. Have a look at verse 13 again. Let no one say when he's tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one with evil. Yeah? Now, 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 temptation is only a temptation. If it appeals to you, right? The fishermen, they use different baits for different types of fish. You don't use worms to try and catch the carp. It doesn't appeal to it. And Satan, when he wants to bring something to you, well, it's got to be something of interest to you. And God never, ever tempts people with sin because there is no sin in him. God is holy and pure and he hates sin. God tests, tests believers, as we saw last week in trials, but he never, ever tempts people with sin. Ever. The purpose of testing is to strengthen your faith. But the purpose of temptation 
is to destroy your faith. That's the difference. And God tests us so we become more like Christ in our behavior. And of course, because of the sin in us, sometimes the test becomes a temptation because of sin in us. But I'm going to focus on that a bit later. But temptation always seeks to destroy. It is always negative. When you look and you look again and again, that temptation has one purpose, to catch you and destroy you. And that cannot be from God. God will not tempt his people with, with sin at all. But James, in verse 14, which I would like to read again, he says, it's not God who tempts us, but each person is tempted when he is lured and test by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. The problem is the desires of our hearts. All of us, we are tempted. And temptation on its own is not sinful. But when we follow through, then it's a problem. Then it's a problem. Temptation comes from your heart, from my heart. The sinful thought such as things like envy, greed, resentment, hatred, and all the stuff. That comes from within, isn't it? It's from your heart. It's the sinful thoughts of your heart that pull you down in the wrong path. It's never from God or from anyone at all. You know, and people, you know, sometimes you... This gender-based violence, you hear the man saying, you know, he, he just knows how to make me do it. She just knows. It's her fault that I beat her. Because she just says things, you know, she knows how to press my buttons. I take no responsibility for it. And God says, you're guilty and you should take full responsibility for it. This is an undeniable fact. All of us face temptation, including you. Dare I say, this includes your husband, this temptation. Should I say, and your wife? Yeah, yeah, and your wife, and your wife, and your partner. It's undeniable. All of us face temptation. How do we overcome it? How do we overcome temptation? Well, again, James is gracious. He will give us answers to that. The first thing is that we've got to acknowledge that this temptation comes from within, a sinful heart. So take, point all the fingers at you. It's me. It's me. It's me. No excuse. No justification. It's me. The desire is not sinful, yes, but the problem with me is that I follow through and I sin. Yes, later James will tell us that Satan tempts us, but at the same time he will remind us that Satan can only tempt you. You're the one who has to take the bait. He never forces anybody. He just puts it there and just slowly, and it's up to you to pick it up and run with it. In other words, you are fully responsible for your sins, for your actions. Yes, you know, the psychologist may indeed point it back to your parents, but really you are fully responsible for your sin. You do. It's you. You did it. Don't blame God. Don't blame anyone else. Just 
have an honest look. How can I overcome this problem? Not the justification, it's just who I am. No, no, no. It's the sin in you. It's not you. You can work with it if you take responsibility for it. We willingly take the bait and run with it. And the thing is, if we were to be honest, sin is always desirable. The thing we hate, it's the consequence of sin, isn't it? We, that's why so many people live a life of sin and cover it because they love it. They just don't want the consequences that are associated with it. And here's the thing, as Moses told these brothers, you can bank on it. Your sin shall surely find you. It's like your shadow. In the night you don't see it, but it's there. And you never leave it behind. It's your shadow. Your sin will find you. When it does, no matter who you blame, God will hold you accountable for your sin. And James says, and he gives us, it's a beautiful, it's a vivid illustration of conception, birth, growth, and death. You know, pregnant woman, you know, it starts small, you know, see with the kids at school, you know, and they fall pregnant and they school, and they cover it up when it's two months and the uniform still fits. And then it's five months and the uniform really doesn't fit. And they try this and they try that. Oh, the parents are about to see what's going on. And, it, and, and, the, and the tummy just keeps growing because the baby is growing. And eventually the baby comes. And everybody knows. And, and, and James says, sin is like that. You can cover it. You can cover it here. You can cover it there. But eventually it will catch up with you. And sin leads to death. So what do we do? How do we overcome sin? Because this one thing we know for sure. The desire of the flesh Conceives, give birth to sin, and sin, when it's fully grown, brings forth death. For the wages of sin, even today, is still death. But the gift of God is eternal life to those who trust in his son, Jesus Christ, today. It was the case then, it's still the case today. Our salvation, indeed, is in Christ as Paul says to the church in Romans. One must die. That we must understand and we must be clear about it. Trials and temptations, sin must die or the sinner must die. But one must die. If we repent of our sins, we live. If we cover up our sins and live a sinful life and only seek to be more concerned about impressing other people with our fake faith, we will still be lost. Are you doing it for people or are you doing it for God? Who are you honoring with your life? For the Lord knows you, knows everything you do. Everything you do, everything you think, the sinner or sin must die. How do we overcome temptation? Will we ever, ever get to a point where we will not be tempted? No. No. For as long as you are alive, you will always face temptation. You go out on those business trips and you're sitting in the hotel alone and guess what? You will be tempted. You watch the TV late at night, you will be tempted. How do we overcome temptation? The first thing, we must recognize the source. It's the sinful heart. It's me. It's me. There are areas in life that I seriously need to avoid. I don't need to go there. I don't, if you're an alcoholic and you go to the pub, 
Well, you're being an irresponsible person if you're trying to stop drinking. I mean, it's the place you really would want to avoid, isn't it? You want to avoid it. If you're struggling with pornography, you get gadgets that block that from your, 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 your cell phone, from your laptop, so that you're safe. Because sometimes you don't have to look for it. It just pops up. But when it does, and it takes you down that road, you are fully responsible for it. So the first thing we need to recognize is us. I am weak, and I need the Lord's strength in this area. And I must do the very best I can to avoid those areas. And the second thing is that we, you and I, have to make a decision beforehand that we would want to serve and honor our Lord in public and in private. Make it. Make a decision. It must be a personal commitment between you and God so that when you face temptation, then you don't have to make a decision because you made that decision a long time ago. I think I've said it here before. I mean, when we younger and working at African Enterprise, it was a lot of traveling we had to do and hotel life because you're not home. And, and I remember so well, Michael Cassidy used to drum it in our heads. When you face temptation and you have not made up your mind about it, it's harder to make a decision then, to make the right decision then. You may make a decision, but most likely wrong, because it's driven by your emotions. You make a decision beforehand that you'll be loyal to your partner, you will not cheat. You make a decision. If you work in a place where you, you're tempted to take things home that are not yours, to make a decision, I'm not going to do that anymore. Or I will never do that. You make this. So when Satan or the, the desires of your heart says, pick it up, no one is looking, to say, no, no, that decision was made a long time ago. I don't do that. But if you have not made that decision and you're like, oh, what now? Oh, uh, oh, should I? Oh, the cameras? Then you, you're gone. Up in smoke. Your integrity, your faith, your testimony, all at risk in that one moment. Because temptation exposes that sin in us. And that is why it is so strong. It pulls us towards sin. But we've got to learn to trust God and say, I will not dishonor your holy name. I will walk in your ways. When people see and when people don't see. And James says, don't blame God for your sin. T, recognize the source as the sinful desires of your heart. And thirdly, don't be deceived, 16 to 18. It's simple, isn't it? Don't be deceived, my beloved brothers. This is the pastor writing a letter to his beloved brothers and sisters in Christ. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. Not the voice from above, right? Eh? But this is God. Every good gift comes from above, coming down from the Father of light, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Every good and perfect and complete gift comes from God. We might be tempted to think that when we enjoy God's blessing, that, oh, it's us. Oh, look, look, look how good I am. Look at the brilliant decisions I've made and look what it has done for us. No, no. Every good gift comes from the Lord. Every single one of them. And everything you love and value and, and cherish at home, it's a gift from God. You might have bought it. You bought it with the money that God had given to you. You might have worked hard to earn that money, but the Lord gave you strength to work hard so you can earn the money. So ultimately, it doesn't matter which way you look at every good 
gift comes from above. And ours is to thank God and praise Him for His goodness, for His mercy, for His love, for His kindness, for His provision, and the whole bang shoot. For He is truly, our God is truly good. And so often we find ourselves in huge trouble because we tend to follow the desires of our hearts. See that? We buy things we don't need to impress people who don't care using credit cards we can't afford to pay. And we still feel good about it. You're in trouble. I'm in trouble if we do that. And when you are in trouble, you have to deal with it. And God says, I will bless you. Yours is to trust me and to walk in my way. So when tempted, remember, every good gift and every perfect gift is from our God. That includes wisdom. Remember earlier he said, those who lack wisdom, ask God for wisdom. There is no wisdom in borrowing as much as you can to buy what you don't need to impress people who don't care. There is no wisdom in it. Ask God for wisdom. And God is good. You remember Solomon. God said, what would you like? And Solomon said, grant me wisdom. He was the wisest man who ever lived. And that wisdom, God said, with wisdom I will also bless you with the riches of the world. You will have everything. Just don't take foreign wives. You will have everything. Just don't take foreign wives. And what did Solomon do? He collected them. <laughs> collected them. Ask God for wisdom maybe this morning. Lord, I struggle in this area. Now, be honest about it. There's an area you struggle, and maybe you've been hiding it. Maybe you've been justifying it. But maybe today you say, Lord, I hear you. Lord, this is the area of my struggle. Please grant me wisdom. Let me do it your way this time. But when you're also under pressure and you feel the temptation's pull is so strong, don't doubt God's goodness. Affirm it. Affirm God's goodness during your trying time. There's an old song we used to sing. And it has these words in it. And though I walk the darkest path, I will not fear the evil one, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff are the comfort I need to know. And I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy follows me. Your goodness will lead me home. Remember the song? When the rubber hits the road, you say, I will trust in you alone. For your endless mercy, my Lord, my God, and my Father follows me. And your goodness, not my ability, not my money, not my children, not my work, but your goodness will lead me if you are able to say that during those trying times, the Lord will carry you through. He will carry you through every trial. He will grant you strength to resist every temptation. And yours is to trust Him wholeheartedly. And yours is to stop justifying sin, but resist it. Resist the deceptive pull of your sin. 
Now, I remember my first year at GWC, I knew the pastor and I knew him very well. In fact, I worked for him. I was his gardener once upon a time. Um, and, and I remember him. He, he came to, to, to me in Cape Town and, and he, he fell from the grace of God. And, and I remember he sat with me and he said, Jomo, never ever listen to Satan's deceptive voice. When he says no one would find out, he means everyone will know about it. And it was so deep because it's a man I admired. It's the man I respected so much. Then, and I was, I was so sad when I heard about his unfortunate indiscretion. But the thing is this. Every time you are tempted, the evil voice says no one will know about it. It's the secret between us. And Satan holds no secret with Christians. None whatsoever. If he does for a moment, he waits for the crowd to come. When the crowds are there, he will lift you up. And when you think it's all good, he would say, you know what is done. And tells everybody about it. But also he will make sure that when you start to pray, he reminds you of your sin of your unconfessed sin, and gently says, you don't have to pray, God is sick and tired of you, just come with me, let's go. Every time you face with the gravious of your temptation, whatever that might be, I will trust in you alone, for your endless mercy follows me, and your goodness will lead me home. And may his goodness lead all of us home. No one be lost along the way. Let me give you time. Why don't you come to God? Maybe there is that sin you want to confess this morning. And affirm your faith in him. Take a moment. Father, may it never ever just be the voices that say we believe we trust in you, that our lives may truly show our faith in you. Grant us strength to resist sin, courage to fight it for your glory. And in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Jomo, for those words of wisdom. Can we pray? Lord, we thank you for these tithes and offerings that have been brought into your storehouse today. We pray that you will lead us to use them well so that your kingdom may grow in power and might. We thank you for the words of wisdom that came through Jomo from you. We pray that we will take responsibility for our sin today and every day going forward. We know that we are weak but you are strong we ask that you will help us to overcome these temptations that affect each one of us and that we will take responsibility for them we ask that you will be with us today in jesus name amen, amen. If I can just